We started community supported shelters only constructing the Conestoga huts. Really, before that, we were making huts, uh, but that was it was for a different uh, reason. But it was always to provide an alternative to the conventional uh, form of shelter, like uh, an alternative to an apartment, an alternative to a house. We just believe in the hut life. It's, it's our lifestyle. We've lived in huts for the last five years. You know, that's been our our sleeping space. Yeah. And then we have we've always had some sort of common house. Mm -hmm. Come in here. Wow. This is quite cozy in here and it's very warm. Well, we have our, our little oil radiator heater in here. And yeah. so you've got electricity. This is our, our closet. We're gonna readjust the bed here soon. Yeah. We keep having to remodel it for our son who wants to sleep with us and now he's wanting his own bed again, so. And we've lived in huts so long that we can't really, it's been really hard for us to figure out, well, what do we live in next? You know, what's our, what are we striving for? Yes. Um, because it, it it's not an apartment. Uh -huh. It's not an apartment. It's, it's not a house. You know, so what is it? So probably just a bigger, tiny house. A lot of people were coming to us and saying, well, what about building something for the homeless? And then it was during the Occupy movement when homelessness really in our area became center stage. We decided, okay, it's time to design something that's quick to build, that's inexpensive to buy, and that's effective for keeping people out of the elements. And that's when we started prototyping the Conestoga hut. And the first Conestoga hut was at an Occupy village. After that, we built one for ourselves, which was a prototype. And then it grew from there. People wanted to make it a little bigger. They wanted a little bit of adjustments. And so we kind of worked with everybody involved to, to make what it is now. We're Gary and Sherry Newman, and we've been living here. It'll be two years this March, and we are blessed to be here. We were under a bridge. We met Eric. He got us in here. This Conestoga hut makes it so much easier. And it's totally waterproof. It's very comfortable. You can fix them up the way you want to. You can put posters up. We would have had it real tiny and real cute if we would have known you were coming, but we didn't know till like five minutes before you got your own. So how much does it cost to build one of these huts? We charge $2,500 for one hut, which that includes a heater, smoke and carbon monoxide alarm, curtain rod, curtain, bed frame, mattress, so there's, there's the hut and then a lot of accessories that come with the hut that are included in that 2500 And then also that, that's, there's some sustainability fee in there that we charge. So if it ever needs um, some repairs, that, that we're able to cover that. In materials, if you purchase all the materials, it's somewhere in between $900 and $1,000 probably. And how long does it take to build one of these? You had two guys working for full days, because we build them in, in batches. But if you were just working on one hut, our estimation would be um, four complete days to build one hut. It, it only takes an hour and a half to two hours to assemble all those modular pieces. And the volunteers love it. It's fun for them. Can you tell us about both the large and the small safe spots? And the smaller safe spots are host sites, mainly churches. Primarily, there's maybe one business and one nonprofit organization that participate in that. Really, that's called the car camping program. That's run by the local St. Vincent de Paul Society. They provide the administering of the porta potty and the trash that is required by our local code for when somebody is legally sleeping in their car. That's what that program is for. Where the hut came in is there's a lot of people who don't have a vehicle yet need a form of shelter. So the Conestoga Hut provides a place for people to sleep if they don't have a vehicle in the car camping program. And that's where, that was sort of the beginning. You know, the need has just grown for, for safe places for people to sleep and, and legal places. For people who have been on the streets and have ever had their stuff stolen, it offers a, a, a huge psychological benefit knowing that when they step away from their belongings that they don't have to be worried about what they're going to come back to. In our safe spot programs, you can get that same sense of relief while also just living in a tent. So our safe spot camps, while we do have some huts there, 
we also have a lot of tents. We have camps that are nothing but tents, and they're on platforms, and they have covers over them. But where the security comes from is having a fence around you and somebody always on gate making sure that the people coming into that camp are people who live there. You've got three different kinds of camps. Can you tell us about that? Well, the camp started off as a pilot project that piggybacks on the car camping program. While the car camping program allows for up to six vehicles or six Conestoga huts, not many churches actually take on six. Most take on in between two and, and four, maybe. The, the safe spot camps, you can have a maximum of 20 people living there for almost the same amount of cost of, uh, of infrastructure. We pay for water, and we pay for garbage, and we pay for the porta potties So the overhead is very low. The three different kinds of camps that we have, we have one that prioritizes people with physical and mental disabilities, then we have one that prioritizes veterans, and then we have one that prioritizes youth homeless. And youth homeless to us is anywhere between 18 and, and 30. Though we do have a lot of mixing. I think we've had in one camp at one time, you know, somebody who's 18 all the way up to somebody who's 65. So it's not that they're totally segregated. We connect with other agencies that prioritize people. And by having them organized differently in different camps, it gives those agencies the ability to connect with just one camp who is their target population that they work with. There's a story about a veteran um, and his wife who were working with different service providers and those service providers weren't talking together. He was getting a, an apartment and he needed to be there to sign that lease at a certain time or else the deal was off. But another service provider didn't understand that and they scheduled him to be somewhere else. And so they called me saying, where is he? We don't know where he is. And I was able to call somebody at the camp and be like, do you know where this person is today? And they're like, yeah, he said he had a, a meeting with this organization. I was like, okay, thank you. And I was able to call that organization and say, this person needs to be there to sign the lease in like 15 minutes. If that camp wasn't there, we would have no idea where that person was. So having everybody organized in different camps helps be more effective with the local service providers. So what are the rules in a camp? The rules are really meant to be a helpful device in your life. They, they ensure safety, they ensure that the social interactions that you have are going to be cordial, and people, for the most part, you know, respect the rules. And they actually appreciate that they live in a place that has rules, and so that's the key. The rules are in place to protect and to make things run smoothly, but the rules that we've got in place are working pretty well. There are currently 17 basic rules in here. Sometimes a, a rule has two or three different parts. What this represents is a, a long process of trial and error. Eric, the director, and the organization of community supported shelters and the people in the camp, we've tried lots of different rules at various times. And we've gotten to the point where we just have the rules that work. A lot of the times camps will suggest, I think we need this rule so this goes smoother. And we started off with you know, some really basic rules and over the couple of years that we've been doing this, with the, with the help of the, the residents themselves, we have made other rules based upon what their needs are to run a, a camp that minimizes stressful experiences. Well, maybe some advice for other cities. How could we start a program like this in Vancouver, for example? Uh, I would say start small um, and, and really and, and connect with the, the, peop the people who are experiencing homelessness or the people who really are the advocates of the people who are experiencing homelessness and get them involved. Because it's not as simple as just building a shelter and saying, here, you know, fill it. It really takes uh, relationship building. And so the first step for, for us is always build relationships and be willing to take some risks. I guess we have a pretty bold city council I mean, not all the city council members were really in support of this, but most of them were. 
this, this program was a risk for the city. And since they taken the risk, they say, wow, you know, we had no idea that this, something like this was possible. So it took them taking that risk to, to learn about something that is really helpful. They, they have kind of a hands-off approach. Our entire contract takes up one page and it's, it's very basic rules. We have our liaison, you know, maybe once every two weeks just to check in about anything that might be going on. Also, I don't like to say homeless people. I like to say people who are experiencing homelessness because you can't generalize the whole homeless population as just being, well, you're a homeless person. I'm just a father who lost his child and I'm trying to find my way. I haven't found it. They haven't always been homeless. Some of them have had careers. Some of them have worked hard their whole life. Some of them have mental uh, disabilities that really prevent them from being able to make it in society. The situations are endless on why somebody's homeless. I found my, my tax dollars have supported this in my 30 years of working. And, 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 I, and I tried to help and donate and thought about people who were in this situation. And now here I am in that situation going, whoa. What is at the core of community supported shelters is we're making a lifestyle that uh, collectively it improves people's lives. It doesn't matter if you have a house and you're just a volunteer or you don't have a house and you need a shelter. If you're receiving, you're inspired to give back. We'd like to give back to the community. We work on the work crews and help around the camp. My husband's a groundkeeper. If you're giving, who knows when you might need to receive. Yeah. And I don't want the help. I'm not going to make a little sign and sit on the corner of the thing. I'm, I can't do that. I can't do that. The only way I can get out of this is I have to work. I have to drive my way out of it. And until I can drive, I have to stabilize my life. Stabilizing my life is stabilizing where I sleep at night. That yeah, is the, the first, first step, man. Step. The first step, because if the you don't have that one, stable place, you don't have that stable place. Forget it. You're the stray cat that just wanders all day until his little paws are just worn out. Right. And my little paws are worn out. Well, I'm I'm glad you you ended up coming here. Welcome here. Eric. Yeah. Appreciate it.